Welcome to today's Friday Forum. Our presentation will be by Judge Brian Van Camp. Confronting and Controlling Pandemics and Insurrections and Continuing Civil Rights Issues in the 2020s. Today's presentation is being recorded You'll be able to see it on the Renaissance Society Forum channel on YouTube. If you have any questions, uh, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type your question and click send. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. The chat feature is disabled. Closed captioning is available. If you'd like to turn closed captioning on or off, click on the CC Live Transcription button to show or hide subtitles. You can adjust the size of the closed caption using the Subtitle Settings button. Now I'd like to introduce Judge Brian Van Camp. He has over four decades of judicial and practical legal experience. After serving 16 years on the Superior Court in 2012, he began serving as a mediator and arbitrator, an arbitrator. In 2020, he was elected to membership in the National Academy of Distinguished Neutrals. Judge Van Camp is a graduate of Sacramento High School, Cal Berkeley, and its law school, Bolt Hall. He then served as a Deputy State Attorney General, Secretary of the Business and Transportation Agency, and Commissioner of Corporations in Governor Reagan's administration. In 1975, he entered private practice, specializing in corporate and securities law as a partner in, most recently, Downey Brand, before being appointed to the bench by Governor Pete Wilson in 1997. Rhetorically, he posits, can the governor close your barber and order your church choir not to sing? Can the president and federal troops move, uh, send federal troops into Portland? While attempting to control the COVID pandemic as well as violent social unrest, governments at all levels tested traditional and constitutional boundaries in restricting individual choice and freedom. What are the limits of the federal government to direct or control either state action or individual liberty to combat disease and or restore order? Judge Van Camp will assess whether the reactions to today's crises are grounded in our constitutional framework or are breaking new ground with long-term consequences. Please welcome Judge Brian Van Camp. Uh, uh, thanks so much for uh, your kind invitation to address the Renaissance Forum. Uh, I've known of the forum and have a number of friends who belonged and know a number of your speakers. You have an enviable record and a reputation as a preeminent forum in our community. I'd now like to uh, take advantage of a longtime Renaissance uh, practice of having uh, poll, poll taking. So, Bob, if you could please put the polls on the screen, we'll address them. Uh, the first one asks, uh, to which political party are you registered? Uh, that'll be AIP, Democratic, Green, Libertarian, Peace and Freedom, Republican, Decline to State. And for any of you who say, well, it's not your business, we've got a button for you. Uh, for whom did you vote in these randomly selected elections? Uh, 1972, Nixon or McGovern? 1980, Reagan or Carter? 1992, Clinton or George H.W.? And 2000, Bush or Gore? in 08, uh, Mr. Obama or Mr. McC McCain. Uh, you'll need to be screening down these poll questions as you sit. Uh, last, uh, tell me how long you stayed in school. What was your, uh, did, did you get high school, baccalaureate or past uh, postgraduate degrees, please? So please fill those out and click on submit, click submit. And we will get your answers. Well, we've got about 60% of the people voting now. Again, as Brian said, just scroll down the screen uh, to reach the other questions you can't see and then click submit. About 70% of you have voted now. We'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, just about 
80% and it's slowing down. So just a bit more. I think we're just about there, Brian. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and show you the results. Good. Okay, great. Okay. All good. Uh, AIP six, Democratic 70, Green one percent, uh, Libertarian no, Peace and Freedom hardly any, Republican 11, Decline to State 11, and prefer not to stay, we had one. Uh, on the next one, uh, who voted for whom in 72? It was McGovern by six by 51 to 16. Uh, in in uh, 80, it was Carter, 70 to 20 for uh, Carter. Uh, 92, it was Clinton, uh, 80, Bush, 18. In 2000, it was about the same, 70 to 20. And uh, in uh, 08, it was uh, Mr. Obama to Mr. O uh, McCain by about 84, 5 to 10. Your highest degrees are, uh, <laughs> not surprisingly, postgraduate. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be in your company on all fronts, and uh, thank you for helping us get a little better acquainted. Uh, at this time, um, we will, uh, okay. So it's one year ago today huh, that the pandemic struck. <laughs> We're one year away from the before times. Uh, in the last year, Americans have lived through arguably one of the most contentious, uh, uh, most uh, consequential periods of government stress in a long time. COVID restrictions have kept some people home, restricted religious exercise, and put economic activity into a coma. Too often, without apparent connection to controlling the disease, or they've been applied inconsistently. Tesla's factory had to close in Fremont, while similar factories across the Bay were not. Home stores could stay open, but couldn't sell seeds, trowels, or paint. Daycares could stay open, as could supermarkets, liquor stores, shopping centers, Planned Parenthood, and marijuana shops. Mom and pop grocery stores, however, were open, uh, were closed, excuse me, as were bakers, gyms, schools, churches, restaurants, and bars, all had to close. This led one wag to say that he could take his son to buy booze or weed, but could not take him to church. He could take his daughter in for an abortion, but could not take her to church. Similarly, government's response to public demonstrations was often erratic. Permits were denied for protesting against stay-at-home orders at the state capitol, based on stay-at-home orders, <laughs> but crowds of thousands protesting the death of George Floyd, very few of whom were wearing masks, were, if not condoned, at least received a mixed reaction from governors and mayors. All these raised questions about which level of government should or may respond, and if so, what level of response is allowed or called for? Excuse me while I... Uh, the microphone switch was... Uh, the uh, <clears throat> human race has fought uh, pandemics for centuries. <clears throat> In the 13th and 14th centuries, the Black Death or the plague wiped out one third of the Eurasian continent. It decimated the economy, but helped give rise to the modern state, equipping it with powers and tools to fight the pandemic. In pre-colonial America, John Fabian's Witt's books uh, depicts two, uh, two means of dealing with a, an epidemic. One is quarantinism. That's the forceful control of citizens through lockdowns, mandated quarantines, and punishment for noncompliance or sanitationism, that's the voluntary participation in public health measures with a focus on eliminating the source of the disease. So in 1647, the Massachusetts Bay Colony quarantined uh, ships coming in from Barbados where they had uh, rampant yellow fever. In 1669, the English uh, philosopher John Locke the father of modern liberalism and individual freedoms, read his own liberty, 
Nonetheless, in his fundamental constitutions he drafted for the colony of Carolina, said that the states have broad power to take care of all corruption or infection in the common air or water necessary to protect the public commerce and health. So when the founders gathered in Philadelphia in 1787, they already had a well-developed body of law on the subject of infectious diseases. But the constitution delegating only certain specified powers to the central government omitted public health or safety. And the 10th Amendment reserved to the states or the people all rights not specifically delegated to the central government. Accordingly, the law of epidemics in the United States springs largely from the police powers of the states, which courts have always held include power to secure and promote the public welfare and regulate the public security, order, health, and morality. But the states are not unconstrained. Both the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment guarantee certain individual rights, which rights have been pitted against the state's public health regulations throughout American history. Given the founder's broad outline then, we are left to decide on the allowable curtailments on civil liberties, including on freedom of speech, assembly and due process, travel and the practice of religious communion. Since then, the nation has dealt with contagions spread through wartime, military ventures into tropical regions, and the Spanish flu, among others. In post-colonial America, we pursued first the sanitationist policies, imposing broad urban sanitary codes. So the Massachusetts Sanitary Code of 1850 declared that no family, no person liveth to himself alone. Every person has a direct or indirect interest in every other person. This comes down to us from Cicero, who said the health of the people should be the supreme law. In 1824, in Gibbons versus Ogden, our sainted Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall said, the power of the states encompasses an immense mass of legislation, including inspection laws, quarantine laws, and health laws of every description. In 1905, the seminal case on quarantinism was issued in a case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts, which had upheld a mandatory smallpox vaccination law passed by the Cambridge Board of Health. Mr. S uh, Jacobson had refused taking a vaccine on medical grounds he said he got sick when stuck. U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harland up, upheld the law, saying that state police powers uh, uh, ha have no real, uh, I'm sorry, saying the state police powers extend to such reasonable regulations as will protect the public health and safety. But he said, if the statute has no real or substantial relation to those objects, that'll be prong one. It has to relate to the object, try to do something. Or he said, is beyond all question, a plain palpable invasion of rights secured by the fundamental law, that'll be prong two. It is the duty of the court so to a judge. Overwhelmingly, <laughs> All courts coming down since 1905 have started with Justice Harlan's two prongs, including a case last week. An example of state overreach, however, palpable invasion of fundamental rights was the 1900 case of Ju Ho versus Williamson. This sprung from an order of San Francisco's Board of Health, where they sealed off an entire geographic section of San Francisco allegedly to prevent the spread of the bubonic plague. The section drawn, uh, however, was exactly coterminous with the existing Chinatown. The court, the court held that was unreasonable and not in harmony with preventing the spread of the disease, Jacobson won. It found that the order was more driven by racial animus than controlling the disease, so it was held discriminatory under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, invades a fundamental right. The board's case was not helped, regrettably, by the fact that 
when the board torched a supposedly diseased house in the district, the fire quickly spread, wiping out most of Chinatown. Two recently published books tell this tawdry tale. We've had anti-vaxxers since at least 1879, resisting mandatory vaccine laws on a number of grounds. First, the wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, did so on libertarian grounds. No government is big enough to tell me to do this. Immigrants, Poles and Germans, distrusted either the government or disbelieved the science or both. Black Americans have opposed or resisted, starting with Frederick Douglass, who said, count me in on the side of liberty. These voices, his voice was joined by those of Malcolm X and Louis Farrakhan. And indeed, last week, Robert F. Kennedy has signed on opposing vaccines. Fighting the COVID-19 uh, COVID in 2020 today. Beginning last March, a year ago, in the before, just before, the, uh, just after the before times, states immediately responded with stay-at-home orders, mandatory business closures, and other regulations. Almost as immediately, <clears throat> individuals, businesses, and organizations challenged in the courts across the country, alleging violations of numerous constitution protections. Still trying to get through the microphone. Excuse me. The uh, First Amendment's right against uh, Congress making any uh, prohibition of the free exercise of religion has been the most frequently litigated. Last year, South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, that's Governor Newsom, the Supreme Court held that the, his limit of 25% or 100 persons uh, attending religious gatherings uh, were unreasonably, excuse me, were reasonably related to fighting the disease. That's Jacobson one. The rules address the problem. Chief Justice Roberts joined in saying uh, they were reasonable because similar or more severe restrictions uh, were being applied to comparable secular gatherings, such as concerts, lectures, and movies. Justice Kavanaugh, however, uh, dissented, uh, saying the rule was an impermissible invasion of personal rights, Jacobson too. The state cannot assume the worst when people go to worship, but assume the, wor the best when people go to work or go about the rest of their daily lives. Just five months later, though, in Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, the court struck down New York Governor Cuomo's executive order, limiting in-person occupancy to 10 to 25 people, depending on the color of the pandemic zone. Uh, the Supreme Court then said these restrictions strike at the very heart of the First Amendment's guarantee of religious liberty. Six separate opinions were written. Justice Gorsuch said churches are not non-essential. Justice Kavanaugh said 10 or 25 percent, uh, 25 person is even more draconian than, last, than the last case. Justice Breyer said, no, the state's health and safety interests outweigh the First Amendment religious rights. And Justice Sotomayor, Sotomayor said, we should be bound by precedent. Didn't we just decide in South Bay's, uh, the first South Bay, that such restrictions were proper? You may ask what gives. <laughs> Similar facts seem to have gotten two different results. Not surprising, judging this audience. Uh, it's a good question and it's, uh, you're right. What changed between the two, uh, the two court decisions? Well, uh, in, the, uh, in the first South Bay Pentecostal, uh, Ruth B Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was alive and voting. And in the Brooklyn Diocese case, she had passed and Amy Conan Bryant had filled her chair. Both decisions were five to four, but with pretty clear opposing results. Who was it that said elections have consequences? I think he was right. 
in uh, South Bay uh, Pentecostal Church v. Newsom to uh, just last month, the Supreme Court struck down a total ban on all indoor worship, saying it had gone too far. But that court did uphold occupancy restrictions to just 25% in the building. And they upheld the ban on singing or chanting, finding that droplets of moisture from breath or forced air heightened the danger. Overall, the Supreme Court has come out more strongly in favor of individual liberties on the issue of religious gatherings, but has still allowed restrictions that are narrowly tailored to fighting the disease. The next challenges have involved freedom of speech. The First Amendment also provides that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right to the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In Givens versus Newsom, the applicants had applied to hold a public rally at the state capitol here uh, and were denied, uh, say, citing the stay-at-home orders. So the applicants sued, arguing First Amendment violations of their right to free speech. The court first admitted that the state capitol grounds were hallowed and deserved a, a higher degree of, de of deference for public assembly, but the court denied the claims, holding that the stay-at-home orders bear a real and substantial relation to the public health, Jacobson won. Also, the order was content neutral since all permits sought were denied, so it was not a subject matter censorship. Also, other means of communicating the protesters' message were available, including especially electronic or social media. The next clause challenge comes from the 14th Amendment, which uses the same language of the Fifth Amendment, but applies to the states. It says, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. But then, in light of it, we had just fought the Civil War, added these languages, these, these words, nor shall they deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. When states ordered business shutdowns to fight COVID, businesses challenged the classifications between essential and non-essential, alleging that these classifications violated the equal protection bar against unequal treatment. Uh, in the League of Independent Fitness Facilities and Trainers against Governor Whitmer of Michigan, the Sixth Circuit said, the governor's order closing indoor gyms, but not other similar businesses was reasonably related to the problem. They upheld the order since say, uh, saying heavy breathing and sweating in an enclosed place is more likely to spread virus and so justifies treating gyms differently than other businesses. Similarly, in Four Aces Enterprises versus Edwards in Louisiana, the court upheld the governor's order closing bars, but allowing restaurants to remain open. They found the quarter was not beyond all reason a violation of the bar's owner's constitutional rights. Jacobson second. The next one was school closing. In Brock versus Newsom, the parents challenged the order closing schools, alleging that the order treats some schools differently than others, and it allows all daycare centers to stay open. The court upheld the order, saying in the first place, there was no basic constitutional right to an education. So the order only needed to be rationally related to slowing the virus Jacobson won. The next uh, challenge was the Fifth Amendment's uh, order that states that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation, colloquially called the takings clause. Lawsuits have been brought alleging the closing of businesses or precluding eviction suits by landlords for non-payment constitutes a taking of the owner's property. In Brick Presbyterian versus New York, 1825, the court allowed the regulation by the New York Board of Health that prohibited internment of bodies 
in lower Manhattan to slow the spread of disease. The court held that the prohibition was not a taking, but was a legitimate, but was legitimate to fight the disease. So the Presbyterian Church could no longer bury any people, any more people in its graveyard. The court went farther a year later, saying that the city could also prohibit inner city graveyards altogether uh, without paying compensation nor impairing the obligation of contracts between the church and the parishioners who paid for their plots. Doesn't this case illustrate the forces applied <laughs> against each other in all these cases? On the one side, you had the New York City Board of Health, whose members may not have been rich and powerful, but they at least had friends in high places. On the other side, they were sat the elders and vestrymen of the churches up and down Fifth Avenue. It had to have included the members of the Astors and the Roosevelts and the Livingstons and the Vanderbilts. Those were people who were rich in power. And they had family plots going back generations. And they expected to lie down next to them when their time came. Telling them now they had to find a plot out in Boot Hill someplace had to have taken some gumption. <laughs> it's a good thing the New York state judges have nine year terms <laughs> instead of the six that uh, we have here. Uh, let me at this point give a shout out to my law clerk, Abby Miles. She's a second year law student at uh, UC Davis King Hall. She found the woodcut of the brick church and the case and many of the cases we're discussing today. Uh, she's even now over in Davis running our PowerPoint program. Uh, please join her and uh, join me in thanking her. <laughs> Isn't this technology grand? <laughs> I still haven't met my paralegal <laughs> who's worked for me for two years, and she's now moved to Idaho, but hasn't missed a filing or a court ruling for me. Uh, the ban on landlords' evictions for non-payment uh, has been challenged and uh, found reasonable. Uh, the court upheld the order prohibiting landlords from initiating uh, evictions and said there was no physical taking of the landlord's property. They left him owning it and said, after all, the landlord could still collect rent from their paying rent uh, tenants. Uh, no discussion has been made in the courts as to how judges or justices or mayors or county supervisors can simply suspend statutes that were passed by the legislature authorizing lawful evictions. Our own Sacramento City Council did that uh, last March. Uh, finally, the legislature acted in August to uh, validate those, uh, those reasons. The Eighth Amendment of the Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment of convicted per uh, persons uh, and that cause has been raised. Uh, historically, prisoners were moved out of harm's way, whether disease or natural disasters. And some California wardens have begun releasing prisoners in advance of the COVID or due to the COVID-19, uh, some 17,000 in California. But judges around the country have come down on both sides of the issue. Uh, on whether the Eighth Amendment requires it. A few, a very few, have mandated the release of inmates based on their civil rights. The voting procedures of our states and federal government have been uh, a uh, frequent uh, source of COVID-related lawsuits. Numerous changes have been made to state voting procedures uh, prior to both the primary and general elections in 2020, resulting in one of the most highly litigated presidential elections uh, ever. On uh, several grounds were asserted. First of all, COVID shut-ins, or those uh, staying away from crowds, wish to vote by mail uh, because of aversion to the COVID uh, germs. And so they sued to be able to uh, request absentee ballots and make mail-in ballots. 
Uh, some lawsuits challenge state rules requiring that mail-in ballots be notarized or accompanied by copies of photo IDs. Uh, battles have also been filed over alternative for, uh, forms of in-person voting, including trafficking or vote harvesting. Uh, many suits challenge the legality of state's executive branch officers, that is, governors and secretaries of state, uh, to change the rules um, in, in, uh, often in the middle of election when those rules had been set by their state legislatures. Constitution Article 1, Section 4, Clause 4, clearly gives state legislators, legislatures, the primary responsibility to set the rules for electing members of Congress. And Article 2, Section 1, grants to the states authority to appoint in such manner as the legislature may direct electors to choose the president. The case of McPherson versus Blacker, 1892, held that the state legislature's constitutional authority over presidential elections can neither be taken away nor abdicated. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court refused to hear a petition from Texas and 19 other states challenging the Pennsylvania's executive branch officers who threw out ballots cast after election day uh, in violation of Pennsylvania legislature's mandate of what to do with the ballots. The high court said it lacked standing over the case. Now it is true that in over 60, that over 60 courts heard the Trump campaign's lawsuits seeking to disqualify votes or certifying the election. Most were turned aside also for lack of standing, but of the several courts who took evidence, no court found that the campaign had brought sufficient proof of fraud to warrant relief. And similarly, while the contested votes in Pennsylvania were insufficient to have denied Vice President Biden the election, as Justice Clarence Thomas wrote in his dissent, that uh, that may not be the case in the future. So the court should address what authority does an executive branch official have to reset election rules in the face of the state legislature's clear mandate? Justice Thomas's call for clarification, uh, clarification is especially timely now that the House has passed H.R. 1, mandating major changes in the way states must hold their elections, including banning state voter ID laws, requiring states to allow vote trafficking or harvesting, requiring the automatic registration of persons as opposed to citizens from roles of the DMV, corrections and welfare, or preventing election officials from checking eligibility or qualifications or removing voters from its roles. This is a little reminiscent of the social issues, social causes brought to the high court in the last 50 years, when advocates for the repeal of state laws against abortion, same-sex marriage, and racial discrimination in college admissions saw changes at the, heart, at the Supreme Court. One difficulty was that the Constitution, not having given any powers to the central government in those areas, and in fact, reserving health, welfare, and police powers to the states and the people meant the court had to find some other way to address those issues. This led Justice uh, Antonin Scalia, among others, to say, if you don't like the laws of your state, get your state to change the law. That is, repeal these laws that you uh, sought, including, as has already been done in New York and California, uh, signed by Governor Reagan, abolishing the uh, abortion laws, anti-abortion laws, or amend the Constitution, as was done with alcohol in the 18th and 21st Amendments, or with women's votes in the 19th Amendment. Essentially, Justice Scalia said, there's no one home here at the court for your cause. The response was, well, <laughs> yes, there is, and <laughs> there are. <clears throat> The court has traditionally had about four votes uh, in favor of those issues. And all we need is one more, said uh, many of the supporters. 
that could save us all those trips to state capitals like Helena, Bismarck, and Montpelier in the winter. So uh, the court majorities found constitutional rights to privacy and an abortion in the penumbra of constitutional rights. And uh, they found a, a denial of the right of equal protection for same-sex same marriage. The court is still sorting through the racial discrimination in admissions cases at Yale and Harvard. The problem for HR1 uh, is not that the federal elections are not mentioned in the Constitution. <laughs> it is that they are. And it clearly says that the state legislatures have the power to determine election rules and policy of each state for federal office holders. Expect some of these points to be raised at the court if the Democrats do uh, get around or repeal the filibuster and enact, enact HR1 and the president signs it. Speaking of the executive and legislative branches, have you wondered how the governors have dictated a number of orders and rules when we most of us learn that it's the legislatures who, well, legislate and the governors execute uh, in almost all cases. Uh, states around the country, including California, have enacted emergency services or powers acts. Our last was 1970. It says the governor has the power to declare a state of emergency and then has, quote, all police powers vested in the state. Okay. Uh, so that's how Governor Newsom is acting. Uh, a couple of assemblymen in uh, California, including Kevin Kiley from Roseville, have brought a, a suit alleging that uh, some 39 of Governor Newsom's orders have violated the, uh, the uh, legislative province and uh, have sought that they be uh, uh, disallowed. Uh, Assemblyman Ky uh, Kiley lost at the Superior Court. That case is on appeal. Uh, insurrections and uh, response. The founders were wary, were wary of a weak army, but did not want standing armies. Uh, in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson said, the king has kept standing armies among us without the legislator's consent. He has quartered his troops in homes and on lands. So we had no national army coming into or out of the Constitution. Instead, uh, Article 1, Section 8 gave Congress the power to call forth a militia to execute uh, the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel, repel invasions. So there was no national army. In 1792, the first Posse Comitatus Act gave the president the same authority the sheriffs had at common law England to deputize citizens to chase a horse thief or get into the fire bucket brigade to put out a fire at City Hall. And uh, early presidents exercised that power to put down rebellions. Jefferson sought, though, the Insurrection Act of 1807 and had it passed. Its current uh, status allows the president to use federal troops uh, in three cases. One, if requested by the legislature or if they're not in session by the governor. Two, to stanch a threat of federal law being broken. Or three, to put down domestic violence preventing enforcement of state laws in a manner that deprives residents of their state or federal constitutional rights. And either the state is unable or fails to protect its people. Previous uses of the Insurrection Act have been uh, to put, uh, well, to, to corral Native Americans, uh, just uh, President Jackson, uh, move them all to Oklahoma, and put down labor strikes in the railroads and the mines. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> President Grant <clears throat> invoked the Insurrection Act. <clears throat> to protect freed slaves attempting to vote and to suppress the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement <clears throat> saw Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson deploy federal troops to Little Rock to enforce school integration and large cities, Washington, Chicago, 
Baltimore <clears throat> after the murder of Dr. King. It was last used in cities in 1992 uh, during the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles at Governor Pete Wilson's request. The government responses to the protests of George Death's killing <clears throat> were varied. In uh, June of last year, uh, protests broke out. Buildings were burned, stores looted, <clears throat> whole person, portions of cities were occupied, sometimes for months by the protesters. And the Guardian estimated that 25 people died in those or other political uh, demonstrations. President Trump threatened to deploy the military if cities refused to defend the life and property. And Senator Tom Cotton wrote in a New York Times op-ed that the federal government should invoke the Insurrection Act. <clears throat> President Trump did, uh, did, invest, uh, did mobilize some federal troops in Washington as he walked through uh, from the White House to the St. John's Church. Um, and uh, he sent uh, troops to Portland to stop uh, threatened destruction. Legal scholars agree that Trump probably had this authority, <clears throat> but few have used it where no invitation is issued. Most presidents are wary of the poverty barn rule. If you break it, you own it. The public's response was a few would pay, fail to condemn the lost lives and the mindless burning. But for every one of those demonstrators, I believe there were many more demonstrators who protested out of a sincere conviction and genuine desire to achieve justice and reform. Many faces in the crowd reminded me of people I'd grown up with or gone to church with, friends at Berkeley who'd left to register black voters and walk with Dr. King across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. Their cause should not be prejudiced by the conduct of felons who burned and looted. Dr. Martin Luther King said at Stanford University in 1967, riots do not develop out of thin air. In the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It's that the plight of the Negro is worsened. Promises of freedom have not materialized. <clears throat> um, and that large segments of us care more about tranquility than humanity. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. We've made progress in the intervening first uh, 50 years, but black parents still must give their children the talk about the dangers in white communities or from law enforcement. Government and commercial entries, uh, enterprises are not as available as they should be. Uh, to too many of us, people of color appear invisible. Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, refers to the need to designate certain people as being necessary to fulfill a certain role in society. That role is to be considered a slightly lesser kind of person. I currently serve on our California Judges Association on Task Force on Equity, Bias, and Inclusion. I'm thinking there are 10,000 such task forces around the country and government, private, and nonprofit, trying to be more sensitive, welcoming, and serve those by uh, the people we serve better. In uh, 2021, January 6th, President called for President Trump called for a rally, and 30,000 people attended the White House ellipse. 10,000 marched to the Capitol, and the Washington Post estimates 800 forced their way into the building. The warning of uh, disruption uh, was heard. Uh, it was. Security was inadequate. Vice President Trump tried to execute the orderly transfer of power, but he failed. I condemn as forcefully as possible the loss of life, wanton destruction, violence, and perhaps most of all, the attempt to disrupt the orderly transfer of power of our government. And most of us would join Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in castigating President Trump for his conduct and complicity in the violence of that day. But a number of the people who were at the ellipse and took no part in the Capitol invasion reported shock at the conduct of the rioters, telling interviews viewers that they were there out of love of God and country and only to seek a fair accounting of the election. 
Can we listen again to the words of Dr. King? The riots do not develop out of thin air, but are the language of the unheard. What can we set aside the Viking hat wearing felon and his conspirators to ask what's not being heard? Their spokespeople say they feel strongly about trade policies that moved their jobs to China, closed their factories and boarded their towns. Open borders and illegal immigrants who drive down wages and burden their communities. The council culture, which removes Washington's and Lincoln's names from schools, Dr. Seuss from bookshelves, and internet platforms, which exclude or inhibit public access to certain political or religious content providers. Like the unheard voices mentioned by Dr. King, the causes of unheard people of goodwill should not be drowned out or prejudiced by the conduct of the felons who invaded and ransacked the Capitol. On, February, on January 6th. In combating and controlling pandemics today, the libertarian threat and American popular reaction to public law has had little uptake in the formal constitution. Rather, we want elected leaders to take all reasonable responsibility <clears throat> to, uh, and precautions and impose reasonable restrictions to keep us safe. But their orders must be reasonable uh, reasonably related to the stopping the threat and must not trample on our recognized fundamental rights. Similarly, controlling and combating public protests and de demonstrations, we insist that both our governments and citizens actions be calibrated to the boundaries established over the last 235 years. But we would be foolish to ignore, as Dr. King said, that certain conditions that exist in our society must be condemned or to otherwise turn a deaf ear to the unheard. Lance Morrow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center said that actually for much of our country's history, we've been two nations, that binaries are the real American way. He lists North and South, slaveholder and abolitionist, frontier and Ellis Island, East and West, urban and renewal, labor and management, striker and Pinkertons, Gold and silver, wet and dry, hawk and dove, black and white, Indian and pale face, and Trump and woke. I disagree. I think the real American way is what we've shown innumerable times in the past, when we've set aside our differences and concentrated on what has brought us this far as a nation, pulling together and what has uh, been pulling together in good faith supporting reasonable laws, reasonably applied to our problems, whether fighting endemics, insurrections, global wars, economic and natural disasters, and all other myriad issues that have faced our country since it began. I hope you agree that that's the real American way. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. I'll be happy to take questions. Christy, I think, has them listed. Yes, thank you so very much. What a, an incredibly extraordinary and timely topic. I'm My head is kind of throbbing, <laughs> Judge. You have so much information that you've shared with us, but I thank you so much on behalf of uh, all of our members, I'm sure, and the Forum Committee for bringing you to talk to us at this time. It's my great pleasure. Um, we have a couple of questions that come in and there may be some more as you begin to answer here. Uh, the first was a, is about Portland and the federal marshals. Um, would they have been instructed to shoot to kill and ask questions later, says the question. Was there an investigation or an explanation of that incident? Well, as I understood it, uh... Well, I think the, the, the questioner says the, the marshals that were sent to conduct the in investigation, is that right? Are the, fe the federal marshals that were sent to Portland to apprehend and su a suspect, were they supposed to shoot to kill and ask questions later, or was there an investigation about their methodology? Yeah, I don't know if that was investigated. Um, the president uh, sent the marshals, the uh, the attorney general sued the president or the marshals or the attorney general, and uh, the court uh, threw it out. 
They said the attorney general of the state of Oregon did not have standing to raise that issue. Um, so the federal marshal, but then the Oregon governor uh, entered a settlement agreement with the attorney general, with the U.S. attorney general, saying that, yes, we will step up and protect your federal courthouse, which was what the federal marshals were supposed to do. And uh, so with that, the federal troops went home. I don't know if the, if the Congress has uh, started an investigation on that. Okay. So I think this next question is in relation to um, prisoners or those in jail. Has cruel and unusual punishment been defined? <laughs> it's been defined about 10,000 times <laughs> since 1789 or 90 <laughs> when the Bill of Rights were passed. Uh, an awful lot of the cases look like uh, the definition of uh, profanity uh, or pornography. Uh, you'll know it. I'll know it when I see it. Um, there are 10,000 cases judging what is and what is not uh, so far. A couple of courts have said, yes, uh, the pandemic is a threat and it's uh, violate, it's cruel and unusual to keep the uh, prisoners in confined closely uh, at the risk of getting uh, that. So let, they let either let them out or change the jails or do something. But uh, that uh, ju uh, those cases are the minority. Most of the K judges really don't want to step between the warden and 10,000 convicts being released into their town. So. Understandable. What is the status of Newsom's use of police powers? Is it still in force? <laughs> Very much. <laughs> he has a, a computer printer that cranks him out pretty regularly. I, I, I judge uh, anecdotally, it's, it's slowed down with the... Uh, uh, either because the code has slowed or he hasn't thought up another, another thing to prohibit. Uh, I, there has been pushback. Um, I don't know. You, uh, your audience, uh, you would know better than I what effect uh, the filing of the recall petition has had on the continued or further issuances from the government. Uh, the pundits you read say, yeah, he's taken stock of that and he's reset his sale, uh, but uh, I think he's still very much in control. And as I said, <laughs> even though Assemblyman Kiley thinks he's intruded in the legislative grounds, uh, the Superior Court here didn't think so. And I'd be surprised if the Third District Court of Appeal would uh, find any differently. The, 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 the act is so broad. I mean, you saw the language on the slide. It says, yo, governor, <laughs> there's an emergency. You take over from here. It's a very, uh, uh, very uh, carte blanche. There's a lot of gray area in all of this, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> That's why there's 10,000 uh, judgments, no doubt. Um, yeah. You referred to the, the 800 rioters that um, went into the Capitol as felons. Someone is asking, can the rioters on January 6th claim First Amendment justification for their actions? What you were you were saying that makes them felons? I'm guessing not, but can you explain a little bit further? Well, um, I appreciate the questioners uh, catching me up on my blanket words. No one's a felon until a judge says so, and uh, I think the Justice Department is up to about four or five hundred. Well, open investigations. I think they've charged two hundred. And those charges are all uh, alleged felony conduct. And uh, a felony in uh, our state is 900 bucks of damage. So I saw more than $900 damage being done at the Capitol on January 6th. So I don't think it's a stretch to use that term, but <clears throat> your question is right. Uh, you don't get to be a felon, you're not a felon until the courts told you. So. Um, do they have First Amendment rights? No, you don't have a First Amendment right to storm into the Capitol and steal the speaker's uh, podium or a flag or something. That is not a valid expression of free speech. 
the founders wanted people to gather in the public square and remonstrate the king or the president or the mayor and uh, do so peaceably. When they step over that boundary, you are outside the penumbra of the First Amendment and you have to answer for your, um, certainly your premeditated acts and even your negligent or, you know, uh, unintended act. If it happened, uh, not all of those are intent crimes. You can be charged just because you went in with a used flag as a spear on somebody and uh, caused damage. So we have another question. Do you think that the South Bay versus Newsom ruling is settled law or likely to be litigated in a future pandemic? given it o- overturned a recent ruling and was decided by a divided court? <laughs> well, uh, it'll be up to the Supreme Court that hears it. But at last count, <clears throat> they were uh, there were three pretty solid liberal votes on that court who might go with you and say, no, as Justice Breyer said, public health has to take sway here. That'll be three votes. <laughs> you got two to go. <laughs> and so far, uh, the, uh, uh, the concern, uh, so far, those, those would appear to be uh, hard to get, at least uh, all two. They might get another one. Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, has been voting with the liberal bloc pretty often. But getting that fifth vote, uh, as I said before, is, well, it can be tough. Okay, I think we have time for this. Just one last question. Uh, Did the recent Supreme Court rulings around COVID run counter to the Supreme Court rulings made in response to the 1918 flu pandemic? That's a great question. (laughs) I always said you had the brightest audiences in town. (laughs) You need time to research because you only have about 30 seconds. (laughs) No, I need time to call Abby Miles. (laughs) over to Davis <laughs> to research that question. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Uh, those questions will be resolved in 10,000 courts around the country. And uh, as I said, these are the kind, that Jacobson case <laughs> versus, Mac- look, can I say this about the Jacobson case? Justice Harlan said, well, you know, it's got to relate to that, uh, to the problem, and it can't invade fundamental rights. Then he's added, I don't know if it's a footnote or a throw. He said, but if there's a health reason for the guy to resist vaccination, then of course we'd go with him. Justice Harlan, Jacobson said, I can't do vaccines. I get sick. Well, that has not been <laughs> brought down in time, but I think it's true. I think if Robert F. Kennedy can demonstrate a illness that he gets from a vaccine, he's got a hall pass. He can't be thrown in jail for not not doing that. That would seem to be true indeed. Well, Judge, thank you so much for your time, insights, and and thoughts about this. We could probably talk for hours, I'm sure, but unfortunately, we've run out of time for our forum, and we're going to yeah. talk yeah. about yeah. Abby, <laughs> Abby Miles had another two hours on this talk. Exactly. <laughs> thank you so much. Keep well. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for having me. It was a great pleasure. Well, thank you, uh, Brian. That was a great, uh, great presentation. The Renaissance Society has made a donation of $25 to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund as a token of our appreciation. The Seth Nelson Student uh, Grant Fund assists students who experience uh, uh, unanticipated expenses or financial emergencies uh, in the short term and require immediate attention. Right. Thank you. Today's presentation was recorded. You can view it in two separate ways, on the Renaissance Society Forum channel on YouTube or from the Renaissance website. Next Friday's forum will be by uh, Director Buck Busfield uh, from the, uh, uh, on the theater, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow, the state of live theater in the COVID era and beyond. 